For years, the United States has meddled and manipulated the politics of many Latin American nations, a policy that continues until today. In just the past decade, for instance, the U.S. has supported a coup in Honduras, several attempted coups in Venezuela. It's continued its over half a decade long economic blockade of Cuba, pumped billions of dollars of weapons and military equipment into Colombia and other countries in Latin America, especially in Central America, and attempted to undermine the energy independence of the island nations of the Caribbean. This all isn't terribly surprising given that U.S. presidents since James Monroe have held Latin America to be essentially a U.S. colony, or as Secretary of State John Kerry said several years ago, the backyard of the United States, all of which allegedly gives the U.S. the right to carry out whatever sorts of interventions and punitive policies it sees fit. Despite the attitude of the U.S. government, many Americans over the years have totally rejected this framing and these policies. And a new campaign led by the peace organization Code Pink is organizing to demand that the United States end its attempts to dominate the region and instead adopt a good neighbor policy. For more on this effort and the broader context of U.S. policy in the region, we spoke to Leonardo Flores of Code Pink. Leo, thank you so much for being with us on the show. It's good to see you, Eugene. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's great to see you as well. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the good neighbor policy campaign that you all are working on at Code Pink. And I guess my first question is sort of a framing question. If uh, you were campaigning to get America to be a good neighbor, I think the implication is that they are a bad neighbor right now. So talk a little about the, the context of U.S. policy towards Latin America that brought you to this um, new endeavor. Sure. So before John Bolton was fired, uh, he would talk a lot about the Monroe Doctrine and the need to you know, revive it. And basically that's what the Trump administration has done even after Bolton left, is they've reimposed the Monroe Doctrine, which has been you know, the, the justification for US imperialism in Latin America since the early 19th century. And, it, the, and it's basically synonymous with gunboat, gunboat diplomacy, with interference in, in, in elections, in domestic policies, and with using the military as often as possible to get what they want, to get what the U.S. wants in Latin America, and so when we were thinking about how to kind of counter the Monroe Doctrine, well, you know, we went, we went back in history and saw that FDR had tried, kind of in response to very public pressure, uh, pressure from below and pressure from internationally, uh, given the U.S.'s uh, roles in the early 20th century, century, late 19th century in, in invading Latin American countries. Uh, and so he tried to implement a good neighbor policy based on, uh, you know, a policy based on non-intervention. It had mixed results, and then it was quickly abandoned uh, to when the Cold War began. And, and so with the Trump administration openly reviving the Monroe Doctrine, uh, we thought it was about time to shine a light on how badly uh, the consequences, how bad the consequences are for Latin America of the Trump administration's policies, and not just Trump, of course, but previous administrations as well. Mm -hmm. No, well, I mean, it seems that this is particularly relevant. Uh, well, I mean, it may be always relevant, but at least in the context right now of COVID-19, because the nature of so many of these policy sanctions, uh, in particular the blockade of Cuba, is having a major impact on the ability uh, of these nations to fight the, the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And so during COVID-19, we're seeing right now that Latin America has become the new epicenter. Well, maybe the U.S. is now the new epicenter in recent weeks. But uh, Latin America is doing very poorly. And when we see in the news, there's a lot of emphasis on Brazil in particular, uh, given that it has some of those cases. And obviously, Bolsonaro has been completely absurd with his reactions to this uh, pandemic. But in, in other countries, there are other countries in the region that are doing even worse than Brazil in a per capita basis, namely Chile and Peru. Uh, it's a disaster, this coronavirus response, um, uh, pandemic. And what we've seen from the United States is, you know, defunding the WHO, trying to back out of the WHO, hijacking uh, PPE that was meant for other countries. And, and so that to us really just struck us. And, and we had to kind of contrast it with, uh, say, for example, Cuba, which is doing amazing work. We can get into that a little bit later. But yeah, so right now, Latin America is facing not just the coronavirus, but it's also facing a massive recession. Uh, and on top of that, we had instability in the region before the pandemic hit. You had massive protests this last fall in say, Chile and Ecuador, in uh, Colombia as well, and as, in addition to the coup in Bolivia, which uh, it looks like it'll never end. 
Mm -hmm. No, well, you know, I'm actually glad you mentioned Cuba because I think in relationship to, to what you were saying in your first answer, this is very important, is, you know, the issue of relations between countries is not just a one-way street. And these unilateral efforts by the United States to declare, you know, these, these blockades and cordon sanitaires around Cuba mean not only, you know, terrible destruction for the people of Cuba, but also in the context of the United States, the knowledge economy of Cuba, particularly around public health, uh, you know, this is a complete closed book to localities and states here in the United States struggling with similar problems. Yeah, absolutely. And Cuba, for example, has this uh, medication called interferon alpha 2b, which has proven to have pretty good results in, in terms of saving lives of COVID patients. And it's not available in the U.S. because of the U.S. embargo. Uh, so this blockade isn't just affecting lives in Cuba. It's also affecting lives in the United States. You know, I hope you could talk a little bit too more about the sovereignty element of this. I mean, I think that's one of the, you know, elements of a good neighbor, right, is that you respect your neighbor. If they want to put chairs on their back porch and you don't want to have chairs, you're not going to tear down their backyard because of it. But the United States seems to insist that a government can only be legitimate if, if they say so, regardless of the people on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So this good neighbor policy has three fundamental principles. One is don't meddle, right? So don't inf interfere in other countries, don't intervene militarily, don't use military threats. Another is respect and appreciate each other's differences. Uh, you know, we have a very diverse hemisphere here with, lot, with you know, lots of indigenous traditions and African traditions and homegrown Latin American traditions. And a lot of that is obscured in the United States. Uh, and because of how, you know, U.S. cultural policy works, some of this knowledge and these traditions are obscured in the countries themselves because all we get is Hollywood type propaganda. And the third principle is working together for the common good, you know, using multilateralism as the basis rather than unilateralism or rather than, say, taking over the OAS and using the OAS as a tool for U.S. policy rather than as a tool for solving problems uh, conjointly. So when we when we think especially about this interference, right, so we've, we've had the Democrats talk for almost four years now about Russian interference in these elections uh, in the 2016 U.S. elections. But, uh, you know, the, the hypocrisy there is really kind of uh, shocking that there very little attention is paid to how much the U.S. interferes on a daily basis on the domestic policies of Latin America. And so, of course, the, the very obvious examples are Cuba with the economic blockade, Venezuela with this puppet president that they've uh, tried to install. But it's really you know, it goes beyond Cuba and Venezuela. It affects every country in the world. Uh, it, so to give an example, uh, the, in the OAS three years ago, when they were trying to, you know, kick Venezuela out of the OAS, it's a long story. But anyway, there was a lot of pressure on Caribbean countries to get them to vote a certain way. And so, and, and I don't mean just regular political pressure, oh, help me out on this, I'll, I'll help you out with something else. It's more like, we're gonna cut aid and we're gonna, hamper your trade if you don't vote the way we do. And this is par for the course for the United States, and it has been in terms of policy towards Latin America for the last 200 years.